Hello, welcome to Talk Gnosis, your source of freewheeling Gnostic and Gnostic-related conversations. Deacon John isn't available for this show, so it's just me, Jason Memel, today. And uh, before we get started, let it be known, on this 12th day of July, I saw a vision of a great Canadian moose, and the moose was called Patreon, and upon it were written the words, we can't do this show without your support. Consider, consider chipping in any amount you like, from a dollar for every piece of media to whatever amount you like. You can go to patreon.com slash Gnostic or to paypal.me slash Gnostic for a one-time donation. And uh, also, yay, let it be known that if you hear a buzz in the background, this is not uh, beetles coming to eat me for my heresy, but uh, no, instead it is just the fan because it is very hot here. Um, so yeah, okay, with the with those invocations out of the way, um, uh, Nick, thank you so much for joining me on the show. Yeah. Um, this, uh, uh, I just finished reading a lot by Alistair Crowley. Um, I read book four, um, uh, all four parts of it, including the Book of the Law, and now I'm really confused about Philemma. I'd always kind of <laughs> known about it, <laughs> you know, I, I know that it was around, I'd, I've heard like the famous dictums like do what thou wilt and love is the law and stuff like that. We've even, like we've done shows on Philemma before, I've listened to those, but I still feel like I don't understand it. So this is kind of more of a newbie, you know, explain it to a newbie show than it is like um, uh, uh, interviewing on, on, a, on an expert um, uh, element of the topic. Um, so yeah, so just based on that, uh, like for, for somebody who has done all this being, but is still confused, what would you say the back of the napkin definition of Philemma is for you? Yeah, thanks, Jason. <laughs> well, I, I, the thing I want to ask you is, is uh, why you read all that, Crowley, <laughs> but, but we can talk about it later. But, uh, yeah, for well, sure, anyway. actually. Yeah. yeah. Um, but if I had to give a really quick definition, people have never heard of it, um, uh, Philema or Philema. I, I say Philema. That's maybe okay. a, a first first point of this. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. But Thelema, uh, but yeah. anyway, so in terms of Thelema or Thelema as a religious philosophy and a system of occultism uh, that was founded by Aleister Crowley, who a lot of people know, um, even if mm -hmm. they're not really into this stuff or this world. Um, and, you know, Crowley uh, was a figure of the late Victorian era, the early 20th century, a uh, member of the Hermetic Order of the Golden Dawn for a time. Um, and he founded uh, Thelema based off of the reception of a book called The Book of the Law or Libra L. Legis in 1904. Um, and so that's really the core text for Thelema. There's a few other holy books as well. Um, and then Crowley in a number of organizations and with a number of rituals and, and other books uh, kind of developed that philosophy from there. So that's the back of the envelope description. But like you said, I'm not sure that helps people that much <laughs> by itself. Well, or yeah, to maybe even to, to push harder there or dig deeper yep. on when, when I say the back of the napkin, like, uh, I, I guess I mean more like, like, uh, and I'm, uh, I am not a scholar or an academic or even really that, that like, well versed in Christianity. So what I'm about to say is really like, a, <laughs> you know, uh, send your hate mail. Yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> but um, I'm easy to find online. But um, the uh, I would say a back of napkin of Christianity wouldn't be necessarily who founded it and when and like and any the particular major books, but like, um, you know, say like forgiveness and sacrifice could right. be like a yeah. back of the napkin mm -hmm. definition. Yeah. Um, yeah. So like, the basic it, concept that gives it yeah. a flavor. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So that <laughs> part of the reason why that that feels a little difficult is because what most people would say, and I do want to make a distinction sometimes between what I think is kind of the consensus opinion about some of this and you know what i might think or i think other you know not just myself but other people kind of really delving into some of this more deeply but i would say that for most for most people the understanding of, of philema relates to this idea of will or true will um you know the the word philema is greek for will uh so philema as will and then and then love as, as you mentioned do as that do what that will chubby the whole of the law love is the law love under will that's usually what people say philema is um and you know that tends to boil down to do your true will or figure out what your true will is and do it, and then something related to love connected to that. <laughs> so that's generally what people. <laughs> but this kind of introduces the first issue there, which is that by itself, and I think this is actually a really hot topic going on in conversations among Thelemites, um, you know, on social media and in organizations. Is there's not a lot that much content to that actually by itself. It doesn't by itself just saying it's about will doesn't really tell you that much um i'm not sure it's saying christianity about forgiveness tells you that much either but we're used to it in a certain way um that you know 
Kalima is not, it's much more recent. So there's not a whole set of kind of, you know, a whole worldview there that we can kind of relate to. But yeah, will, yeah. love and will is probably the, the two concepts. Um, mm -hmm. And then a whole mm -hmm. lot of conversation about what that means. So yeah. <laughs> of course, of course. Yeah, and, and I, I too like, well, and maybe part of the reason I make that distinction or the, the reason like uh, we were saying that, that Christianity has that benefit of, of that extra time. Mm -hmm. I think that said, there is also kind of a thing in which you could say um, elements like virtue or sorry, virtues like, or, or maybe not virtue. Anyway, the, the point is, is that saying to the idea that like maybe sacrifice is valuable because you're contributing mm -hmm. to something or um, uh, um, uh, forgiveness is, is, is it, is it like these are things that maybe don't need you don't need a footnote to explain the value of right. sacrifice yeah. or the value of um whereas you do need a footnote to explain will <laughs> you know yeah um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's like right from yeah. the start there's a footnote but but that, that that's going to lead to some of my later questions i think um uh, uh and, and, I, and I, I think the other thing too is that i think any fellow might listening to this i i think i am a little critical but i'm also mm -hmm. trying to be open which is why why nick was great Great enough to have this conversation with me. Um, yeah. So I just want to make sure that people understand that this isn't a hit piece. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so, but so that you're seeing that there's a lot of discussion around those definitions. Yeah. Um, uh, what would you what would you say? What's the appeal or the value of uh, Thelema as a religion or as a, as a as a system of belief? Um, uh, like, and I, I think as you're saying, maybe like, what is that sense of what's the current consensus or the cons current you know, uh, trend yeah. in that, and then maybe, or if, if that's in any way distinct from your own, or from maybe what, mm -hmm. what it was initially, that kind of thing. Yeah, I mean, so that this is where it gets complex, and I, I should say that for me, you know, I I do identify as a Thelemite more or less at this point, but I also I'm in the weird position of also being a Christian still, <laughs> so um, and somebody who went right. to seminary yeah. studying Christianity, so that. I'm already not like a pretty, you know, that's a weird position to take for, it's mm -hmm. not like common. So I do want to distinguish sometimes, you know, between what is a consensus view and then what is mine. And then, you know, and, and also a view of that's kind of, I feel is developing. That's not just mm -hmm. my view, but isn't necessarily the consensus view either. So I think mm -hmm. the appeal for a lot of people to Thelema, to be really honest and like serious about it, is that they, they, they encountered Aleister Crowley through some kind of countercultural you know, aspect, you know, comic books or music or something, mm -hmm. um, you know, they frequently the people in, at least in the United States, um, probably in Great Britain too, uh, that are interested in it were raised in some form of Christianity. And, you know, this follows the path Crowley took because Crowley was raised in a very strict form of Protestant Christianity. A lot of what he wrote and, and the way he developed this philosophy was in reaction to that upbringing. And I do think that remains a big appeal to people, to be honest, there's an aesthetic mm -hmm. appeal there's a sense of kind of the sovereignty of the individual that people often see in Thelema, which again is something that is a little more complex on, than it seems on the surface, but I think people are drawn to it for that idea. This, this idea that you mentioned sacrifice and you know Crowley was very critical of this notion um, in Christianity, which he saw as the old aeon, and that's part of his jargon, of mm -hmm. this idea of you know sacrifice just being a virtue by itself. Um, right. So, you know, so that, that actually plays right into, you know, to some extent, Thelema is not that intelligible at, apart from understanding it as, you know, we're in a new era and then there's this old era that it's, it's being kind of put up against. And I think that plays out in a lot of people's lives when they become interested in it for the first time too. Um, so that, that I think is all true. And then I don't think that that's completely wrong, I, but I do think that the reason at this point in my life that I'm still interested in it and not just interested in it because, you know, I, I started reading it, reading Crowley and the Book of the Law when I was 15 which actually is 20 years ago this year. Um, oh, wow. you know, I, I, don't, I don't think it's the same reasons anymore, you know? And I've gotten out of it several times and been very opposed to it several times. But so I, I would say, and I can get into that if that's helpful, but I, I don't think that my, I think that if you're gonna stick with it, you usually have to move beyond those reasons, um, which mm -hmm. of, of kind of revolt. Though I do think that's built into it as a system. So I don't think it's wrong, but yeah. yeah. That's interesting. And I definitely the vibe I got as I was reading it, there was a lot there was, there was a lot that was sort of critical of, of the the order of the day and is trying to set yeah. up a new order or a new, a new mm -hmm. way of thinking. Um, um, and I should also say too, like, I found like there, there's a reason I kept reading, you know, like I found yeah. <laughs> a lot of value and a lot that was really interesting as I kind of went through yeah. it. Um, 
Um, I, uh, I, I've got uh, anybody who's not listening to the, the podcast, I'm holding up a big blue book. Uh, yeah. like it's like the book four. Um, yeah, I've got my the, one, the mine over here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, which I bought like 15 years ago or something like that. Um, uh, and it's got these little um, sticker tabs in it. So I like, I've clearly found stuff of value that I wanted to remember as I was going through it. Um, but uh, 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 what was I going to mention? Um, uh, oh, sorry. And the reason I mentioned that what I just said there too was based on what you said about the reasons for being into it now are different maybe than what they were when you started. Yeah. Um, uh, and I think when you mentioned that notion of like revolt and maybe it's not like it's not totally the same for that now um, or it isn't necessarily the same as people move through it. That's another thing that I've noticed is like I've seen Thelemites on social media, on blogs and things like that, make a point to say that that uh, Thelema goes beyond Crowley. Um, yep. Now, this is like just I'm, I'm assuming that's true, but I'm also kind of like how 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 much does current Thelema still have engage like with, with Crowley as a how do I put it? Like how far past Crowley has the Lima gone? Um, yeah. I, so yeah, again, that's that's a very current debate that's going on. That probably has been since Crowley died, but I don't <laughs> think you know. I on on some level, it hasn't gone beyond Crowley though, is a thing because, and I don't really think you know. I'm someone who maybe has said something similar to that in the past, but I would really want to qualify it with you know Crowley. You don't have to agree with everything he said, but he's still a very important obviously and also honestly pretty intelligent kind of commentator on what all of this means so mm -hmm. it's not really that useful to just be like well crowley you know he said a lot of racist sexist and honestly stupid things sometimes <laughs> so we're just gonna get rid of him i mean that doesn't really work you know no. you're gonna end up back to some of the ways crowley commentated on the book of the law you know the ways he mm -hmm. developed the philosophy it, to me, I think there's something going on here that's related to the whole, like, people interested in it frequently came out of Christianity because there's a sense that you have to either reject this person or accept him as an infallible prophet. And mm -hmm. you don't really do that with a lot of other things, like with poetry and philosophy. And that's just not, you know, you're already accepting a certain sense of religion to be able to have to do that. Um, mm -hmm. Crowley can be really, really helpful and interesting. And I think you know, my interpretations that keep me in invested relate to Crowley still. Um, so I think going beyond Crowley means, you know, not thinking that Thelema is just, you know, the word of Crowley as as kind of the founder of the religion, but then I don't think it makes that much sense to have this idea that Thelema has nothing to do with Crowley. Or I mean, that's, you know, so much of the Book of the Law is cl clearly filtered through his own psychology that mm -hmm. you can, it, it doesn't make that much sense to reject him that way. So. I think that's still a debate going on too. Um, right. Yeah. Um, I, I really loved what you said there about how we don't do, we, we don't perform that same level of like acceptance or rejection as a binary when it comes to um, uh, poetry or philosophy. I think that's yeah. like, I, one of the things I've been saying is that for me, um, a lot of this like esoteric practice, uh, uh, whatever I, I quantify as the, as the, the experience of Gnosis is for me a, an experience that is most fundamentally easy to explain through language of aesthetics. Mm -hmm. And so I really, like what, what, just when you said there, mm -hmm. like um, I can think that I, I, I can love William Butler Yeats and yeah. I can still find a poem in there that I think sucks. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, <laughs> and I yeah. don't have to, I don't have to say that, that that poem actually doesn't suck. It must be, um, it must be true, truer than true somehow, because I, I don't, yeah. I, I don't perform that same, um, assumption with a poet as I would with a with a prophet. Quote and, you know, yeah. but in defense of the question, I mean, it, it, it's Crowley's fault <laughs> that this happened because he said he was the prophet. <laughs> and as time went on, he became more and more kind of convinced of that in a, in a kind of, and he was very authoritarian to his father. So, you know, actually this is, you know, I mean, this is again, not totally my original thought. Um, there are, and I talked to you about before the show, but there's a website, thelemicunion.com that has a lot of kind of uh, you know, contemporary writing and kind of op-eds about Thelema. And I would say one of the debates going on right now is is this aspect, you know, Crowley, um, he, he was very critical and kind of skeptical for parts of his life, but other times he really demanded obedience from people. Um, mm -hmm. So the debate about how much does his, does his politics matter or his ideas about gender or all that sort of stuff, I'm sure if you asked him in his life, he would 
maybe he would say something kind of like, you know, it's you have to figure it out yourself. But I then then think he'd actually be like, no, you should just do what I say because <laughs> he was pretty authoritarian. So that is, it's you know, the same goes for the argument about true will. What does that mean? Crowley, mm. you know, and this is another article that's really helpful on polemic union is that there are multiple definitions of true will, and they come from Crowley essentially. He he jumps mm. between them depending on what his purpose was in in that writing, uh, and yeah, they're not like, necessarily compatible. So, yeah. Um, uh... There's a there's a thing there you said there about how he's really authoritarian, but and yet so much of what his own work started out with is the sense of rebellion. Yeah. Um, there's it just reminds me. This is a quick cul-de-sac, but uh, uh, one of my favorite sci-fi writers, Cory Doctorow. I don't know if he originated this phrase, but I heard it from him. Said um, all pirates want to become admirals, yeah. which is to say <laughs> that like the, the 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 pirates want to want to shut down the system. They want to you know do things their own way, mm -hmm. but then as soon as they gain a level of power and responsibility. Mm -hmm. They don't. They want to. They want to keep that. They don't want to leave things open for new rebels to come in. You know. Do you yeah. know what I mean? Um, yeah. And so Crowley's then, relationship. Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. Oh no. It, like literally, I was just going to say. Like maybe you were going to go there. Is that like? Yeah. It's it's interesting to me that Crowley would start off kind of like, like as a punk rocker, and then be like, no, you have to play my music the right way every time. You know. <laughs> well, yeah. So like when he he kind of revolted against the the Golden Dawn. I mean, that kind of early part of his career, and you know, created this new system that's kind of building off of it. But then mm -hmm. people in his lifetime, you know, Frater Akkad, who I've done a show with Jonathan on, is yeah, one yeah. of my favorite writers. I mean, Crowley, as soon as he started kind of branching out into his own stuff, Crowley absolutely condemned that. Um, similar with people like Kenneth Grant, you know, Jack Parsons. There's a lot of other people that have done, developed film in some other direction. And usually Crowley was not into that. <laughs> it was not, he would, and he would find something really wrong. So I, I do think that's, that's an aspect of the going beyond Crowley argument that goes on. There are people mm -hmm. that are like, very opposed to this idea of developing it, uh, you know, past what he may have written. And then there's other people who are, you know, kind of want to jettison him. I, I don't really think either of those things, um, but yeah. That's okay. Well, th this might actually lead to two different conversations that I, uh, or to two different questions that I've got. Like, so I'll, maybe I'll mention both of them and then maybe we can figure out which one we want to go with first. Is that like um, the notion of uh, uh, like, there's the book of the law, which is kind of that's the that's that the the, the holy mm -hmm. text. Um, but then there's all this like there's the other three books of book four before that, like a lot of his writing. Which I guess did all of that. Maybe you can tell me did all of that come after book of the law in terms of writing? Yeah, yeah. Um, that that book. So the book of the law was was received in 1904. So the rest of that that book, um, the yeah. big blue book, is that came later. I think it, it was in the either the late. Uh, actually, I don't want to say exactly the date because I'm not 100% certain at this point. Um, but, but yeah, that definitely yeah. came at least a decade. Uh, you know, yeah, the, like so parts of it were in the late 20s. So that's it's all that's a big gap. Um, right. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, and, and I'll say actually a lot of that later stuff that is before the book of the law of the book, but written later, I will say uh, uh, there's a lot I really like there. A lot, of, a lot of really great phrases and ideas and things that like I can expand to my own practice. Um, so, which is actually maybe that's kind of where I'm going is that, is that it, it feels like the real lesson I like, like if after I read through the, the whole thing and I'm thinking to myself, okay, how can I apply this? It isn't for me to feel like I need to decode what Crowley wrote and I need to decode the book of the law in any great depth, uh, you know, and like in terms of spending months and years of my life solely in that pursuit so much as it's an is an inspiration to kind of think as broadly and and read as deeply as Crowley did you know and to try to like build on experiences like create my own experiences that create my own book of the law which I would hopefully never tell anybody that they have to follow <laughs> but um like uh, uh, I feel like uh, uh, Alan Moore has kind of done this in the in in the arts world is that like he's He's avowed himself a magician. He's clearly following a lot of Crowley work, um, but yet was also like uh, doesn't appear to be taking the book of the law as the law, <laughs> and mm -hmm. and has produced artistic work um, that communicates that he's had mystical experiences that have led him to create literary works. You know, yeah. um, but that the figures and entities that he's interacting with are clearly connected to Moore and not Crowley, if that makes sense. Yeah. Um, so yeah, Good. yeah. Uh, so so yeah so to, to package all that together like that the that like for me uh, what you're saying there about how other people are going beyond the book of the law and beyond Crowley 
is that that to me actually seems like that's the best lesson of of Crowley and, and Thelema is is go you know go on keep going go find your own you know um, book. Uh, mm -hmm. Conversely, is that like I have a really hard time after like reading it all and I even read the commentaries, like I have a really hard time accepting the book of the law, <laughs> you know, um, as uh, like I didn't find the poetry in it to be like Keats is better, you know, Yeats is better. <laughs> um, yeah. uh, uh, and I think more more evocative and had like uh, more mystical for that matter. Um, there's even stuff in there where I'm like, you're clearly, to me, it felt like clearly somebody writing something so that it would give him as many like religious bolt holes that he could, you know, like, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, uh, stop asking because that's, that's the worst question you can ask. I'm like, well, that seems like you're shutting down critical thought. That's never a good sign, yeah. <laughs> you know? Um, and uh, yeah, like, so, so I guess that's the thing is that like, um, I can, I can totally believe in a Gnostic experience, but I, after reading the book of the law and feeling like I'm a relatively uh, like that I'm, I'm, I'm smart enough to, to be able to detect things that like, I didn't buy it, you know? Um, mm -hmm. I, and I was open to yeah. it. I was open to, to mm -hmm. trying to find something there. But um, so th those are, I guess, the two questions. Like, it seems like the book of the law uh, help, maybe, maybe you can help me understand how that can be strong enough to, to hang on to as a, as a, mm -hmm. as a Thelemite. And then, yeah. Uh, it, are there people who are choosing to go in their further in that further direction entirely and kind of go the book of the law is a step not a not a end point you know yeah so let me try, I'm trying to kind of pull that together so I think because it, I think it's a really good question I think so for one thing I think paradoxically to some extent the book of the law actually kind of tells you to do some of what you're saying <laughs> without it, it definitely is not saying Crowley's never saying to disregard it because he does consider it to be you know the holy book and the special revelation uh, but on the other hand it, and this kind of finally gets to you know what i still think in Thelema is really interesting and important which is um you know the self in Thelema. like what is that what what is that defined as Crowley of course uses this metaphor of a star and the primary kind of aspect of that is, and he's, I think he says this in the, you know, in, in magic and also in the introduction of the law, but a star for him is an aggregate of experiences, essentially. So mm -hmm. what you are is not kind of like, you're not like a pre-made essence or something uh, that, you know, and, and this does run into some of the definitions of true will, which sort of start to suggest that. But my reading of it and what I think the book of the law actually is saying is, is what Crowley says at one point in a later text uh, that the book of the law is a commentary or a series of commentaries on the idea of nothing. And that's a really core part of his philosophy, which comes out in various places. So mm -hmm. nothing, um, which is in, in I, I believe it is in magic as well, but this idea of the zero equals two equation, which I actually see, and I've made this argument before, as a bigger aspect, uh, in, you know, in terms of Thelema as a worldview that's unique than any of these other things. Um, so yes, I mentioned, you know, in terms of the napkin definition, will and love, but I actually think understanding what Crowley means by nothing and by zero equals two actually gives you the distinctiveness of Thelema as a worldview more than any of those other things. So I do Ooh. want to say, I may not yeah. be, you know, I'm not the only one who says that, but I'm also, that's not the most common thing. So I don't want to mm -hmm. misinterpret or misrepresent that. But so to kind of get back to the idea of the self or the star, so you're saying, you know, like Alan Moore or someone, you're taking this and then you're kind of developing you know, your own direction. I mean, that's that's where you're supposed to, as a star that's moving kind of through the body of Nui, as the way, you know, Crowley using the metaphors from the Book of Law would say, you are uh, constantly, uh, you know, as an incarnate being, you are engaging in new experiences and you're kind of uh, bringing those ideas and those experiences into your, yourself as a self um, and that mm -hmm. they change you every time they happen. So one chapter that I really love um, in, in Magic in the Big Blue Book is about the formula of EIO um, and Crowley's, like he transforms EIO, which he defines in the Golden Dawn terms as this idea of life, death, or birth. You know, this is the kind of idea of Osiris um, in the Golden Dawn or uh, Jesus Christ. I think really it's more about Jesus Christ than anything mm -hmm. else, honestly. <laughs> um, and then, but he transforms it for the new Aeon into this other formula, which he's, which is, uh, you, I guess you're saying out loud, it's V-A-O-V, or it's, it's, uh, 
he adds a vav in Hebrew to before and after Eo. Um, oh, so that, okay. that, that gets into all the, like, the weird Crowley like, jargon stuff, but to define it really simply, his argument is that you know, existence isn't just about like a catastrophic life, death, rebirth kind of situation, but that actually what he says is every moment is actually a death and rebirth. So in every moment of experience, as you move through, you know, existence and reality, and, you know, you are being kind of destroyed and reborn um, in your incarnation as a star. And that star, you know, moving through the body of Nui like a star through space, because Nui is, is the metaphor of space. And, and through and so, you know, and so like you're saying, you know, that means that um, as you, you know, d as you develop as a star and as you have these experiences that change you, um, you know, that that is going to result in different expressions. So, for example, art and poetry and, you know, other holy books. You know, there are Thalmites who have written post-Crowley holy books. Kenneth Grant has is a really interesting one by Nima who wrote, uh, you know, she wrote about Ma'at magic. So she okay. wrote her own holy book. So that is a theme that comes up. I think it doesn't have to be holy books, though. It's just, you know, you're going to have a self-expression as, as you develop. So to me, the big difference between, you know, Thalima as a worldview um, and this kind of old aeon, if you want to use Crowley's way of talking, uh, worldview mm -hmm. is that in Thelema, every experience is meant to be, you know, undergone as a sacrament. So one line that's really great in the Book of Law says existence is pure joy. Um, mm -hmm. So that means that there's kind of this kind of scintillating, you know, ecstatic experience in every moment. And that really gets to me, it gets to the heart of what Crowley means by zero equals two and what Crowley means by some of these metaphors about the star, about Nuit and Hadith, and also some of his obsession with sex. Though so that's another, that could be its own <laughs> conversation. But that, that so yeah, I wanted to make sure to get that in there because I, I, I think what we're saying is important, but there is something that's unique, I think, in Thelema that can, tends to get lost if you're just defining it purely as, you know, do it that wilt or something like that. Totally, um, so, yeah. yeah. I think that's, that's fascinating and I think, um, like, I mean, the, just the whole thing, like every man and woman is a star, that really speaks to me as a Gnostic, yeah. you know? <laughs> um, yeah. uh, and and a lot of what you're saying there, like that scintillating experience of life, like, or that, that, is, that, is, that is capable in life is like, or that, that life is capable to have is, uh, yeah, like that, that sounds like what a Gnosis experience is, yeah. you know? Um, yeah, and every moment, I mean, what Crowley, you know, the other thing, the change from EAO to this new formula is also that it's not just like a, a moment of, you know, spiritual experience that is special or set apart. It's also, Crowley's literally saying every single moment, oh, <laughs> like that moment, your cat just jumped down. Like every <laughs> every single thing that happens is changing you um, and is actually kind of the creation of the world anew. Uh, so and, that to uh, me is beautiful, but yeah. And uh, Amucho the cat here brought you a moment of pure joy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and in, in that, Crowley's in, I think there's actually a lot of similarities between Thelema and, and Taoism and also mm -hmm. Zen that I think some people have, I mean, you know, people have pointed this out. It's not a new thought, but mm -hmm. Crowley himself points this out. But I think that sometimes it's put more in the context of the Golden Dawn kind of Kabbalah and kind of Neoplatonism and all that. And I think that could actually miss a lot of what's sort of unique in, in Thelema because Crowley really was syncretizing a lot of different ideas. Totally. Well, and th this actually, um, this might be a great space uh, just because you brought in um, uh, like the Tao. Would, it, would this be a, a good space to bring in the zero equals two notes? Sure. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I could explain that maybe quickly. It, so basically Crowley's, <laughs> I, Crowley's idea, you know, he was very, it, it's pretty clear that he might have actually been reading like German idealism when he wrote some of this down. So there's okay. like a Hegel, I know John is not here, but there's a Hegelian aspect or like a dialectical aspect to his thinking right. that is really important. Okay. So, you know, Crowley thought that ev basically everything that existed is the unity of opposites, and which is a pretty common alchemical or esoteric idea. But then, you know, the ba most basic in math, you would say like positive one and negative one, everything is like consists of the equivalent of that. But Crowley pointed out that positive one plus negative one equals zero. So um, everything has a unity of opposites, but also so everything uh, is is half of an opposite that when combined with its opposite kind of equil equilibrates or balances to zero or nothing. So mm. the universe is simultaneously zero or nothing, and it's simultaneously two, which is being or, you know, 
what we see, our, the real world, right. day-to-day life. Yeah, yeah. And it's very similar in some ways to in Mahayana Buddhism, you know, exist, uh, uh, form is emptiness, emptiness is form. Mm-hmm. So it's the two sides of that equation. Sometimes I would argue, and then this will get in the weeds, that Crowley screws this up sometimes and then starts to try to relate it back to Kabbalah and kind of ruins what's good about this because he sorts, he, he tries to relate it back to the kind of emanationist Kabbalistic stuff. Um, yeah. But I think the Book of the Law is zero equals two, I think, does sum up what the metaphysics of the Book of the Law are. Uh, so, yeah. I, I, I think that the thing I noticed most about, about Crowley's writing but that I noticed, and because I, I do actually remember the zero equals two, because I think it was in the the, the, the introduction to the Book of the Thoth, or yeah, the Book of yeah, Thoth, uh, uh, yeah. you know, tarot description book of his. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but, uh, uh, or was it the Naples Arrangement? Is that what he called it? Was yeah, that? I think so. Yeah, it's definitely yeah. in the Book of Thoth. It's it's also in like uh, Magic Without Tears. Um, yeah. It's probably yeah, yeah. in the, it's probably in, in book four also. Yeah. Um, but uh, what was I going to mention there is that, yeah, like, because he'll have these really cool ideas. Those are the, like often when I would make a little, put in a little sticky note. Um, but then he'll feel that, feel this need to like somehow prove it. You know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, you can. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. And, and that's always when I'm like, dude, just like you had the good idea. It was good enough. Like, you know. Um, His in, proofs, in, he tries to be mathematical sometimes and it doesn't, it doesn't convince people <laughs> in general. No. Yeah. No, exactly. Yeah. Um, uh, well, and sometimes even his even his math proofs or his like, you know, um, uh, cultural proofs of like, oh, from this, this means that is that like, yeah, but you made a few assumptions about those things when you made those proofs. So yeah. like, <laughs> so it's it, yeah, I mean, which, I, yeah. Oh, go ahead. oh, no, 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 no. Go ahead. Oh, no, I guess want, I want to say just what zero goes to because I think that could seem very abstract and like a kind of a metaphysical, you know, assertion. But I think taken and I think this is what the book of the law is also saying, um, you know, going, taking it back to our, the conversation about like experience and every moment being a sacrament. It's mm-hmm. what he's really saying is that every moment you live, not just in like a special kind of spiritual moment or religious moment, but in every moment as a kind of incarnate person or being, um, you know, you are combining yourself with some new experience or new thought or new idea, um, mm-hmm. either, you know, mm-hmm. mentally, physically, whatever. And, that that infilima is is symbolized through Nuit and Hadit, the the union between those two entities that are in the Book of the Law. Um, mm-hmm. In in each of those, ex- which he would describe as kind of an ecstatic moment, that's kind of the existence is pure joy idea, because there's this ecstatic union in each moment. Mm-hmm. So in each moment, you're both kind of you know you 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 die to your previous self and you're reborn as this new self, um, and you die because anything combined with its opposite in Crowley's terms becomes zero. So it kind of annihilates itself. And yet at the same time, it also results in a new manifestation. Um, so right. it's very, this is very kind of, it's like a, it, to me, it's actually similar. And I've talked to you about this a little bit before, but process philosophy has some mm. similar ideas where it's very, it's, it's, it's not a static view of being, but it's a very dynamic view of, of being and of reality. And that's mm. what makes me really excited by it. And I think, um, a lot of Crowley's ideas about like particular practices and I think the ways he interprets the book of the law and, you know, a lot of that actually, if you, if you kind of internalize some of this zero equals two stuff, it all makes a lot more sense. If you right. don't, or it actually doesn't, it, it's, it's kind of just kind of vague occultism, but there is something unique there because I don't think most, you know, it is common in more Eastern traditions, but in a lot of Western traditions, that isn't the way we think about being generally, which tends to be more static or, you know, based on a platonic ideals or something, which I don't, I, I don't think is in Philema. So. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, that's, that's fascinating. And this is exactly kind of why I wanted to talk to you about this because, um, yeah, I'm definitely like some of these ideas, I don't think I really, um, uh, I really, uh, in, internalize nearly as much. Um, um, what was I going to say? Um, going, look, just looking back at my questions. So I, I do want to maybe talk a bit about, um, I do, I want to touch on the book of the law, yeah. um, as a, cause we, we sort of sketched around it, but like, um, and you, you did mention that like, you know, it's, a you know, these are like received texts that he got in 1904. Um, uh, and that like he spent years afterwards, 
writing commentaries about and explaining and other people were explaining and things like that. And, and then I kind of um, uh, <laughs> uh, shit talked them a little bit saying like, um, I didn't think they were that great. You know, I thought they were like, <laughs> there was some interesting stuff in there, but then there was also seemed like it was packed full of stuff with Crowley, like, um, like planning his, his, uh, uh, like planning the the organizing structure of the corporation that was going to be his new new religion. Right. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, it feels like he's sure. kind of like, like he's setting himself up. You know. Mm-hmm. Um, um, so yeah, like it. Uh, I guess I'm like so as somebody who's critical of what I read, because um, I didn't think there was interesting poetry in there. Like the stuff about Hadith and Nuit is was mm-hmm. interesting, um, uh, but then like, but it's. How do I put it? Like, I think I would have been interested in a book of the law that was about like a third as long. <laughs> do you know mm-hmm. what I mean? It's already mm-hmm. not that long, but in terms of what I what I enjoyed. Yeah. Uh, so. Do you, you mean like, chapter three? Um, <laughs> because well, most people want to get rid of that, I think. <laughs> I probably found the least value in chapter three. I yeah. Say. Yeah. Um, um, uh, but. Uh, yeah, like yeah, like but even in the first two, like it, it, there's probably maybe twenty lines or twenty verses, I, I guess, in in both of the first two chapters each mm-hmm. that I would say like, okay, those were cool and those are ideas that I want to kind of dig on, and then the rest feels like it's like it, it doesn't. Uh, I, I don't want to just I don't want to just just trash uh, the book of the law. Where I'm going with this question <laughs> is like um, how. To to uh, the Lemites now, how important is it to accept the Book of the Law as as a true received text? Um, uh, and if so, how do they engage with the kind of with folks like me who go like, guys, I'm I'm not seeing it. Do, do you know what yeah. I mean? Yeah, for sure. I mean, it it's hard because again, I mean, I think that if you talk to the Lemites, they're probably the ones who are going to be most willing and able to tell you all the holes in Crowley's story about receiving it. <laughs> so it's right. not a hidden, I mean, it, that's a very, that's like a pastime, I think. So I think like, I, I don't think I could, would say that most uh, Thelemites accept it in that literal way. Uh, that's probably not true at, at all. Okay. And I, I think that, uh, you know, I think Crowley, it's hard because he also, you know, Crowley implied that he didn't like the way it was written either, you know? So at first mm-hmm. he said, and this is part of his narrative, but he said that he, he was everything about it, like revolting to him. He put it like, he says he put it in an attic, like the man, and he didn't look at it for a long time. Um, mm-hmm. And so a part of his, his own personal kind of reception narrative involves not appreciating it very much. Um, so I think, you know, I think the, the difficulty with, with some of this is like, most Thelemites don't agree on anything. So they certainly will not agree <laughs> on what it means to receive it. On the other yeah. hand, our, it is because of Crowley's background, can, and he, you know he was very liberal Christian uh, in a way that was, as a member of the brethren that believed in the Bible literally. Um, you can see that playing out in how he re- had a received text, which is sort of unique in a lot of not maybe not now, but for a lot of occult tradition was not the way you know things were were founded. You know, like so, I think that he. You know, it's clear that it, it was set up to be like the Quran or the Bible, um, and so, and Crowley certainly believed that it had to be like accepted that way. Um, I don't, I just don't think a lot of people would agree with that. Um, and again, it kind of goes back to the way you're thinking, you know, about Crowley as a prophet or religious figure. If you think that you either have to kind of accept it as being given to him from like God or something like that, you know, mm-hmm. recite it. He, I mean, he says he heard it. It was like in the corner of the room, and he wrote it down than like the Quran, then you, you know, that would be enough for a reason maybe to reject the whole thing. But I think that I, I also come from a, a school of, you know, of, of Christianity um, in terms of like higher biblical criticism that I don't, you know, I'm, I'm used to not <laughs> reading texts that other people think are literal in that way. Um, right. And I think applying some of that to the book of law is probably very important and healthy. So, okay. you know, I, I don't think it's the necessity to take it that way. Um, then again, you can find people, especially on Twitter, who believe it's literal and will like go off on you about stuff. So there are people, I'm not right. saying nobody believes that, but I, right. and I don't think the organization's the big, I'm not a member of OTO, but I don't, I would tell, I would, I would doubt, um, you know, first of all, their policy is that it's like to each person's individual interpretation. And so I, I seriously doubt 
it, it's not like a policy to take it literally in that way. Like, okay. That's what yeah. I would say. Yeah. Well, and I'm, I'm gratified to hear that because yeah. <laughs> um, after reading it, like, I think I literally was saying to Jonathan, I'm like, I, I read the book of the law and I'm like, I, this is why we're talking is because it was like, how can, how could anybody subscribe to this? You know, um, after yeah. like, to me, it felt so hard, so shaky, so shaky a ground to, to really base things on. Not that other religions haven't had similarly shaky grounds, you know, yeah. um, I'm not saying that Philema is unique there, but like, yeah. I mean, um, I think, so, I think Crowley would have loved to be as successful as like Joseph Smith. He actually wasn't as good a, a salesperson <laughs> as, as, <laughs> as some, like he just really wasn't. I mean, he made it, to, it like you're saying, it, it's a lot more, it, it seems, I don't even think it seems, it is a lot more complicated and has a lot more complex, you know, occult and like, literary flourishes that you know it's not mm -hmm. it's just not as appealing to it's not something you would put like a gideon bible and that people would be more willing to read that way i think so. yeah, yeah yeah exactly in a way there's kind of a um he, like he sort of gets in his own way as a as a writer yeah. if that makes sense yeah. like yeah uh, he does a lot and but i do think on the other hand I, i'm saying all this but i obviously like you know i have a copy here this i got <laughs> i think again when i was 15 this is and it's been with me since then and so I actually really do appreciate it. So all of what I'm saying, I'm, you know, I'm being a little sarcastic, but on the other hand, clearly yeah. something has kept me with this for a long time. Um, totally. so, I, yeah. so I do think that our people and many people who pick it up and read it and are like, don't get it immediately or something, but have, it doesn't mm -hmm. leave their mind in some way. So, and it's yeah. had an impact in, in a lot of ways in pop culture and, and definitely occultism, obviously. So it's, yeah. it's clearly not, it's, it's, there's something there, but you know, yeah. That's yeah no and I think that's that's a great that's a great way to put it and in fact actually like you were asking why did I spend all my time reading yeah. all that? Um, and it actually was because like because of Alan Moore you know I mm -hmm. I, I was a uh, was and am still a big fan of uh, of Alan Moore's work in comics and in yeah. prose and he does he's done these performance pieces that are esoteric in nature um, and uh, and he's written a lot about Crowley and refers a lot yeah. to Crowley and so there's kind of this thing of like well a writer I like seems to like this guy it seems to like this this person yeah. so i want to you know like it's like you kind of you uh you, you try to go back to the source of the of that might be inspiring the person you're inspired by um uh and yeah like i definitely like i, I read through this over the last i don't know like half year or more like mm -hmm. a year um just a few pages a day or occasionally uh, and sometimes that's all i could stand <laughs> um and and other times i was i was really like finding it really engaging mm -hmm. um uh and uh, but there were earlier times where I was definitely bouncing off of the, the uh, Crowley's writing uh, mm. in this book. Like I'd, I'd actually I've, I've actually read the Book of the Thoth tarot book, mm. um, and I've read Magic Without Tears um, uh, years and years ago. And those I somehow found more engaging. Um, maybe because those those two books are often less often less often than this trying to um, ascribe any particular truth so much as it is a a practitioner's experience if that makes yeah. sense mm -hmm. uh, which made them oh, yeah. more palatable yeah yeah i agree about the about those books yeah and and so i mean it's also i think we mentioned it but the book of the law was not is not necessarily in in the big blue book you know i mean it's in it i mean that you can read it separate from that so it's not in Thelema, there's, you know, the Book of the Law is published first and mm -hmm. the other class eight, there's a distinction in, in Crowley's writings between, and it's from his organization, the AA, called class A or class B or class C writings. Mm -hmm. Class A writings are, are the ones that are supposedly received by him, you know, not mm -hmm. written by him directly. Um, and so the rest of, you know, book four is not, a, is, it's commentary and it's, you know, teaching, but it's not considered a holy text in that way. So that there's a particular set of writings, the Book of Laws foremost, and then a certain number of others that are considered to be these class A received texts. Um, so even right. in that, you know, when you think about Crowley's own statements about how he rejected it at first and all that, you're not really, even even with him as the prophet, and if you accept that, you know, it, it's sort of set up that his own opinions might not be the most accurate interpretations. Um, and that actually is in the Book of Law too, where it sort of says you're not gonna, to him, you're not going to figure this all out. Um, so right. there's there's been several moments in history that's come up, yeah. <laughs> which which again from a, from a like if I were trying to write um, <laughs> holy texts and I wanted to make sure I had an escape hatch, yeah, I would that, definitely yeah. say. <laughs> uh, and, and yay, I say unto you, very few of you will get the whole picture, you know. And, yeah, I, uh, I, yeah, no, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. 
Well, and I, the, the joke I was going to make is if Crowley were alive today, they would say like, and yay, I say unto you, join my Patreon for fourteen ninety nine yeah. a month, and I shall give yeah. you the, <laughs> you know, the premium members will receive the wisdom. You know? I'm sure people have written, but there's a lot, there's a whole tradition of writing chapter fours to the book of the law. I'm sure somebody on Patreon has has said if you subscribe, we'll give you the chapter four. So, but <laughs> but uh, well, but let's say a positive thing about this. I mean, I think. You know, in terms of the debate about like where did it come from? Did he just write it? Is it all like mm -hmm. bullshit that it's 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 hard because it's like I think when you get really deep into some of the philosophy, I think Kenneth Grant's actually really good on this, and he's another really complicated and clever controversial writer. But oh, I think sure. that there's a level where it's like it stops mattering whether it was a discarnate entity that was reciting the Socrates or whether that comes from like the deepest parts of his psychology or whether mm -hmm. you know or he just wrote it because. There's a certain understanding that you know Kenneth Grant talking about H.P. Lovecraft, for example, in this way that you know his his creative work um, is tapping into this this level where it's not just the individual I, you know, the I self, but is this like deeper levels of consciousness. Um, and I think even just based on the in, impact the Book of the Laws had, it, it's clearly part of some deeper level of consciousness. I and, you know, so I actually do take it as in some sense like a holy text, like my own personal way of thinking about it now is a little bit and this relates to the whole christianity aspect which would be a, a side but you know mm. renaissance christians read like the hermetica for example as as like oh as almost holy text in some way alongside the bible they they had some sort of they were inspired in some sense so i kind of think of the book of law as similar to something like the hermetica but for this you know post 20th century existence so i do think crowley mm -hmm. was very good and is one of the most convincing aspects of his writing is diagnosing, uh, kind of like Nietzsche, you know, what what our society is like. Maybe he helped influence that because he was mm -hmm. kind of influential, but he wasn't that influential. So I think he actually was, <laughs> he was like accurately analyzing this aeon of the child, the way that people, you know, are are acting and behaving, and in, in a way that I actually think is pretty convincing. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean that it's yeah. like a God wrote it or whatever. But it, it does mean that there's some level where it's reflecting like the consciousness of some aeon. So yeah. that's my slightly religious take. <laughs> well, and I think there, there's two two interesting points there um, that I think uh, that I wanted to touch on is that you I think you said like whether or not it was a is a an, um, discrete super, supernatural or divine yeah. entity speaking to him, or if it was his his uh, like an element of his psychology. Um, like or you know why not both you know like yeah. Um, yeah. like one of the one of the most powerful statements that I think I remember reading in, in esotericism was uh, Juan Mother Duquette's um, of course it's all in your head you just have no idea how big your head is and <laughs> yeah uh, part of what I love so much about that is that it it tries to like it actually shifts the the like in that in that zero equals two way it sort of shifts the the conversation away from it has to be one or the other and allows you to examine, and this kind of gets into the, the other, my other thought is allows you to examine what is its value, mm -hmm. never mind, n never mind its source, you know? Um, I, yeah, I agree with, I like, I mean, there's been debate about that quote too, which is funny, <laughs> but I, I agree with it as, I, I, as much as in, as long as it doesn't just turn it into kind of like a psychologizing only, like a psychological mm -hmm. model only, which I think some people take that to mean, but I agree with you if it is, if it's kind of, exploding the distinction between like inside and outside you know mm -hmm. like that in that which i think kenneth grant does as well like you know th i think that's what that, that that's how it relates to me so yeah clearly the book of the law comes out of crowley's consciousness because the ideas of the, the names of gods and you know the stuff from the golden dawn like the equinox of the gods ideas mm -hmm. from the golden dawn like all that clearly comes from his consciousness filtered through that but then like William Blake or something, it, it's connected to a, a layer that is more universal in consciousness, and to me mm -hmm. does reflect a his, a, an era, like a historical era, which he would call an aeon. So I think that that is true. So, yeah. yeah, and and uh, um, uh, or like I mean, what was it was it Keats that said, uh, "Truth is be no beauty is truth, truth, truth beauty." beauty. Yeah, yeah. Um, which is kind of one of those things in which like um, the it's. I mean, I know I was slamming the poetry of the Book of the Law, but like, <laughs> but the the, uh, um, the 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 beauty of the some of the ideas in there make it true mm -hmm. enough, whether or not it, it had a, a a binarily defined one or the other way of coming into being. And I, I just as even a, a personal statement is that I agree 
Uh, I agree with the interpretation that um, you have no idea how big your head is, is meant to explode the idea of inside and outside and yeah. not not meant to reduce it to psychology. I right, think people yeah, who are hearing yeah. that are just afraid, afraid that it's that it's reducing their experience, but like, no, it's 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 going the other way. <laughs> it's right. Yeah, no, doors, I think I you know. Yeah. Yeah. Um what was the there was something I was gonna say there about um about oh shoot. Um oh yeah, like just what you said there about it being uh its ability or its quality as a holy text has less to do with it, with reading it specifically literal, literally, but but in terms of its capacity to have a spiritual and emotional impact on your on your day-to-day -day life. And I think like as you said, like his ability to diagnose where we are and where we've where we've been, you know, and maybe where we could go. Like yeah. there is a, there, there yeah, I think that that's very valuable. Yeah, and I, I think some of the, the passages, especially in the third chapter, that are very uh, you know difficult to read, the ones that seem particularly kind of vicious or you know like uh, the one <laughs> or the or just violent, basically like the violent imagery. I mean, it works mm -hmm. when you think about how he he saw it as you know this was this was before World War One, but then he lived through World War One and World War Two, um, and then you know everything going on now even. So it feels it feels accurate to the what to kind of the breakdown of 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 like a central truth of you mm -hmm. know Crowley was really influenced by Nietzsche and, um, and all the all kind of the theologies that I'm interested in are sort of in that following along that vein of you know what happens after God is dead and God in the sense of um, being this kind of consensus on on being and and truth in reality um, and I think that mm -hmm. it does sort of chapter three even in its more kind of vicious moments it feels like it reflects that in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, Crowley saw it very much as, as predicting the atmosphere, not specific events. Some people have tried to do that, um, but this, the, the atmosphere of kind of the 20th century. Um, so, in which we're still pretty much living in, I think. Of course, yeah. So, yeah. yeah, we're the, the blast radius of the 20th century is pretty yeah. big. Um, the, uh, the thing I was, gonna, I was gonna ask is, oh yeah, so I think um, uh, there's, so, uh, like, uh, I, I'm always big on trying to connect for any, like, for a Gnostic who might be this, their first, their first talk, talk Gnosis episode, and they're wondering why we're talking about all this, yeah, uh, Thelema stuff. The, um, uh, like, they came here for Sophia and Archons and Demiurges, or what have you, <laughs> is that, um, is that, uh, uh, like, for me, part of the reason I was interested in this is because I think there is something Gnostic in terms of that, that, that kind of reality or experience that Crowley is often reaching for and trying to get to um you know uh, one might one might say that the the communion with your holy guardian angel which we haven't even really touched right, yeah. <laughs> um but like which is to say and i think crowley's even said is kind of a higher version of yourself or a, a, a you know a, a deeper level um uh could be could be classified as a gnostic experience or touching a, a source mm -hmm. um uh but um, so so that's me kind of for any Gnostics kind of going like, why are we talking about this? What value is this? Um, but then the other thing is, is that there's also a lot of, I think, confusion. Um, at least at least I was confused because there's like there isn't there like an um, like a Gnostic mass that Crowley has yeah. in his. And yeah. is, that, is that in any way connected to Gnosticism as we know it in terms of classical Gnosticism or anything like that? Um, yeah uh well yes so it is so oto has a gnostic church um is is based, and that's okay. where the gnostic mass takes place um and in a lot of major cities you can attend so um it is actually directly connected to the french gnostic tradition which i know ajc is connected to in the sense yes. that the the founders of oto that kind of crowley inherited oto from had a charter you know it gets really murky and confusing but to do some branch of the french gnostic church and they combined that with OTO. And then of course Crowley took over and did not keep anything from the tradition really. Um, mm -hmm. it, besides, you know, he, he, he wrote a new version of a mass that was very influenced by the Catholic mass and by the divine liturgy of the Eastern Orthodox church, um, trying to kind of portray Thelemic concepts. Um, so, that, so that doesn't, you know, it's, it's kind of, maybe it's debatable, you know, among someone who knows who's a scholar on it, like how much Crowley actually knew about the French Gnostic tradition, but there was a link in some historical way. But um, in terms of it being Gnostic or not, it's a little hard. I would say that there are aspects, like you said, that are very 
connected to Gnosticism. So, you know, the idea of having a kind of uh, personal gnosis or a, a personal, you know, uh, religious experience that like, so yeah, definitely the Holy Guardian Angel. Obviously, like Kabbalah is really central to Thelema because Crowley got that to the Golden Dawn. Um, mm -hmm. And so those ty that type of Kabbalah. Um, and then, uh, you know, this, the, I would say this idea of union of opposites is cl clearly connected to alchemy. Um, I think there's similarities to Bohem and Crowley and Babylon in a lot of ways as a figure yeah. is actually similar to Sophia. Um, and people, many people have pointed that out by now, I think. So there are, there are similarities. On the other hand, I would say that, again, because I, I kind of want to relate everything back to this, the zero equal two stuff and kind of all that, because I do think it, it shows what's distinctive. Crowley did critique very directly Gnosticism from that perspective too, because he did not think that, and I know this is, again, then we'll get into what is Gnosticism, which we get, of course. but like Crowley <laughs> was like, we do not want to think we're sparks of a pleroma. So he was very clear that, so what sometimes people, I've directly read Thelemite saying, you know, oh, every man, every woman is a star means that we're all sparks of the divine, but Crowley actively says no to that. We're not parts um, in that way. So because, and I would say the reason for that is because the kind of primordial or like, you know, the 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 highest reality in Crowley is zero or nothing and not a metaphysical unity. So not a Neoplatonic one, not a pleroma, it's actually zero. Um, and that actually does, I would argue that does actually change things in his in, in his philosophy that makes it right. different than, so it, it again, to me, it's closer to Buddhism in that way, but yeah, it's arguable, but yeah, that, so he does say, you know, we're not parts, we're not sparks of a one basically. Right. Um, right. Yeah. Yeah. Like the, um, I think what the, the HAC patriarch is called like Gnosticism is sort of like, uh, um, qualified dualism or something, because it's right. like, it's a dualism that's encompassed by a monism, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And that, and that is similar. I mean, Crowley, there's a phrase, Jonathan, and I've talked about it, uh, dialectical monism that I think mm -hmm. Philema actually appears in the Wikipedia page. I don't know who came up with this phrase, but like people <laughs> like that, that has been, cause it is dialectical in the mm -hmm. sense of it's this interplay of opposites. And then it's also, there's a monism because everything, you know, zero, again, two equals zero. So all of being does kind of resolve in this kind of unity, but it's not a unity because it's not one. So it's right. not, um, so it, it, it there's a nothingness, um, so, or emptiness. So yeah, that, yeah, I don't know. So that, I don't know if that helps. I'm probably just confused, thing, but yeah, <laughs> no, but it, no. is, it is important, so yeah. Well, and like, like, there's also that question of like, what is Gnosticism? Is that like, and I mean, I'm, this is also just me speaking for myself, but like, um, I like, I feel like whatever it is that we're touching in an experience of Gnosis is so uh, like, uh, like apophatic, like we, we have no words to describe it yeah. and no, not even an ability to wrap concepts around it. All we can kind of do is really sort of brush up against it. Um, so in, in, in my mind, anything that seems like it's helping brush you up against an experience like that mm -hmm. is a Gnostic or Gnostic esque <laughs> experience. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, uh, but I will definitely agree that anybody who's, who is following a more like a stricter definition, um, in which there's a, a particularly a particularly fine view could, would be able to say no, Thelema-esque uh, or OTO-esque Gnosticism or the way they're using those words, there's not the same. So like that's yeah. a... I did want to, I do want to recommend people whose ideas about this have, you know, uh, shaped some of mine. So that I put up a, a link for uh, Frater and Telakea has a blog. He's a really great kind of philosophical writer on Thelema. Um, and some of this that you mentioned about apophatic mysticism is like kind of his jam, I, I would say at the moment. So oh. and that's another very interesting, and, this, and you know, it's been, I've had a good conversation with him before on his YouTube channel. So I recommend that to read more about some of those those ideas. And what was the name of that person again? Uh, his name's Fratra and Telakea. So he's he's on Twitter and all that sort of stuff. Okay. I'm just, I'm not yeah. going to try to spell that. <laughs> <I'm> <laughs> yeah, get it yeah, wrong. Yeah. Um, uh, there's a banner here on the on the screen, and uh, hopefully we'll get it in the show notes there as well. So for anybody who wants to who wants to see that, um, but that's that's great, and I think that's kind of a we're, we're getting kind of close to an hour here, so that might might be a good spot to generally wrap up on. Let me see if there was any other questions that I wanted to to touch on. Um, uh, I, I think um, the so yeah, like we we've this has been pretty far ranging, but it's it's given me a lot more to to chew on regarding. The Lima and how how it can work and how how it, it has been working, is there like we spent a lot of time on Crowley, a lot of time on the Book of the Law. Um, is there anything that like uh, you'd want to talk about people 
people like uh, such as yourself or like or maybe in general about how people are practicing Philema now? Um, mm -hmm. uh, is there anything that like you know what 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 does a what does a, a, a current Thelemite look like when they're you know when they're when they're about to, to start a session or something you know? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that there's two things there. It, it, one is that even though Philema, you know, the biggest organizations are still OTO and the AA, Crowley's AA, and the various lineages of that, the vast majority of Thelemites are not in an organization. They're solitary mm -hmm. in some way. Um, you know, they're either trying to practice like rituals based on reading Crowley or, um, you know, actually I think a lo even larger percentage of people are just kind of reading Philema as a philosophy or a way of life and then you know, writing their own rituals or, you know, pursuing or doing other things. Even so, like, you know, people are, mm -hmm. you know, involved in Buddhism or Tantra or like a lot of other stuff. And then Philema becomes this point of reference. That's kind of like a common kind of common point of reference. And I think that that's actually a pretty healthy development. So one thing that I guess think is starting to happen is Philema is not just, because I think for many decades, Philema was just a set of rituals and things that Crowley did or wrote. Mm -hmm. But I do think there are people trying to push it out of being like that, that just a, a practice and being more of this kind of worldview that, you know, it, it doesn't, you don't even have to necessarily practice magic. <laughs> so that's mm -hmm. another thing that that's not, Crowley thought that, that this idea or the, the law that he would, he called the law is the law is for all. So it, it's not just for occultists or people practicing occult mm -hmm. stuff or magic, but it's actually like a broader thing that he wanted to see influence culture more generally. So. Mm -hmm. I think that that's happening a little bit, but um, you know, the vast majority of Thelmites are probably still, you know, solitary practitioners working in a kind of the Crowley post Golden Dawn style ceremonial magic, and which is still, you know, really cool and powerful. But um, so, you know, the, I would say some of that those rituals are in that the, the are in in magic in Book Four. So, you know, mm -hmm. like Libra Resh, the other things that I think you have like Mass of the Phoenix, Star Ruby, uh, mm -hmm. LBRP, all that sort of stuff. People generally start with that. I would say still. Yeah. Um, but then okay. I think going beyond that, you know, people are developing their own techniques, really. So that's another thing, like, I want another, you know, I know I'm plugging a lot of other people, but I just want to give credit because these are not <laughs> all my thoughts. But so like Mott Magic by Nima um, and the organization that's very kind of, uh, you know, open source that she's helped to start with other people called the Horus Mott Lodge. Um, you know, they've developed an entire kind of uh, like corpus of rituals and practices that kind of go beyond Crowley's uh, version of Thelema. And so that's also very current right now. Uh, I know they're developing a lot in different directions. Um, so I, I'll give a link to that here. <laughs> you know, oh, great. To give as much stuff. And I, I think they're really interesting. I was involved with it a lot more in the last couple of years and not as much now, but they're, you know, they, they also, especially in terms of things like, you know, gender and sexuality and like, all that they're pushing it in a way that Crowley wouldn't have done, but is really important. Okay. Oh, cool. Well, uh, let me let me see here. I'm just going to go back to my questions. Is there anything that um, that you feel like we haven't touched on when you, when like I, I pitched this show to you and uh, we were starting to, to think about it? Like, is there anything you're like I want to make sure I talk about this? Um, I think. I think the only thing is that, you know, it, it took a, I, I think it's understandable and actually says a lot about Thelema that it took a while in this conversation to get to why I even was like, why I care about Thelema. And I think that's because so much of it gets bogged down within like who Crowley was, like how the book of the law was received, like all these and arguments about OTO and all that kind of stuff that like mm -hmm. there, it can be lost that there was a distinctive philosophy and like, and that Crowley did develop out of the Book of the Law that, you know, relates, again, I think it does relate very strongly to this idea about nothing and zero equals two and kind of all those concepts that are actually really interesting and sort of unique, even though they have precedence. Um, and I think that I would recommend people just to kind of try to get past some of the jargon and stuff and think more about that. Um, and mm -hmm. like, you know, and some of the people that I'm linking, like Selene McUnion or Frater and Telekea's blog, or even Horace Mott Lodge are kind of developing things in those directions, maybe getting mm -hmm. past some of the arguments, because otherwise it'll just stay with like an argument about what Crowley said or what he was like um, personally, and like arguments about like history and not like, why, is, why do we care? <laughs> so I think getting to why yeah. we care is pretty important. Um, well, so yeah, that's all. I, I, this is another thing too, actually. We, I did a Q&A with um, 
uh, uh, Bishop Tim and yeah. uh, John the other day. And one of the things we actually said in there, I, I think Tim said it really well, was that like, um, uh, like should somebody follow a Gnostic path was, was one of the questions. And, um, and, and Tim was like, no, you know, like we, we, <laughs> we talk about, about everything other than experiencing gnosis like we, you know we like yeah. we, we we dig into the the deep archaeology and the, the scholarly te you know text and stuff and um now i i think uh um <laughs> the the flip side of that is that sometimes for for some folks going into that detail is part of how you crack your head open you know for sure yeah um and, yeah. and let's see some of these ideas if you're in. listening you probably are like that I'm sure, though, there's for everybody like that. There's also people who might buy the book of law or something, and it did have an impact on their life, and like artistically or in whatever way, maybe negatively. Yeah. But it like you know. But then, and they're not going to listen to something like this. But so yeah, no, I mean, I, I agree. But yeah, I do think yeah. it is important to get to you know, Christians are tent, Protestants are pretty good at this, where it's like the Bible has something to say about every aspect of your life, and occultists are generally not. <laughs> so you know, yeah. but, but yeah. Crowley thought so about his book. So yeah. True. Yeah, true. Um, uh, where was I? Where was I going to go there? No, I, I. Yeah, I just think I. I. I I'm glad that you brought it back to uh, less about the debate and more about the like. What is your like? How do you practice this? How do you engage? How do you engage with these ideas? Yeah. You know whether or not you agree with them, um, versus like debating the semantics or debating the history. I think that's a that's a really valuable piece. Not to say that the debate isn't important, but. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I think um, somebody like Alan Moore, you know, with chaos magic, especially like they, you know, I, a lot of those people didn't identify necessarily the thelemite. They just took from it what they needed. Mm -hmm. was, uh, sorry, actually, uh, maybe I might have lost the thread there. Do you mean like um, Moore, Moore taking what he needed from th Thelema? Oh, yeah. I, I, oh, I just meant that Alan Moore as part of the kind of milieu of like chaos magic, just many of them were influenced by Thelema, but I don't think identify as Thelemites. Um, you know, in, right. that, in that phase of magic, people were just taking stuff as, they were, there's a, a lot of influence from the Book of the Law, but not a lot of people identifying with it religiously, I think. Um, right, right, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. In, like engaging with an idea, but not engaging with a philosophy, or not engaging yeah. with a, a loyalty, perhaps. Yeah, or yeah. institution, yeah. Yeah, um, great. Well, I think, uh, yeah, this has been great. Um, uh, I don't think I've got any more questions. I, I, we could keep going. I mean, maybe I'll, I'll think of more questions and we'll have a, like, explain Thelema, or Thelema to a Gnostic part two. Um, oh, sure, yeah. But, uh, yeah, no, thank you for the time. And thank you yeah. for for uh, um, spending all this time with me. Um, I'm going to just put up some stuff on the screen here. I'm going to say uh, that you can find me um, uh, on my website at jasonmemmel.com. Um, and I, uh, when I mainly I work for a theater company called Sage Theater, and that's at sagetheater.com. Um, if again, if you want to contribute to the show, we've got a couple of ways. There. We've got patreoncom gnostic. Uh, we've got uh, paypalme gnostic. And then uh, Nick has a blog that he that he updates, and I think it's the lightinvisible.com or .org. .org. Um, uh, and that's where you can go for uh, for more thoughts that you've been hearing from uh, from Nick. So thanks very much, Nick, um, yeah. and uh, we'll we'll talk to you again.